so I found um, Guy's introduction was really resonant, I think, with the story that hopefully um, you guys will enjoy hearing from us today um, at One Door, and really what role technology played in showing how do you start creating that value conversation or the return on investment conversation with your clients. So just by way of introduction, I wanted to explain a little bit about what One Door is and what we do, and a brief introduction on my, myself. So, at One Door, we have a visual merchandising software that retailers use to communicate promotions to their stores. So if I say that a little bit differently, you're all cell phone customers, you all have various providers that you use, we see commercials, or you get your direct mail pieces where they say, you know, unlimited data, next line free, new family plan, whatever that might be. And when you're, as a shopper, you expect to go into a store and you expect to see that promotion show up in some way um, in that store environment. You expect it to be posters, you expect it to be new devices or accessories or price changes on devices in those stores. And all those changes need to be communicated to those store associates to execute in some way and that's really where our platform comes in. So our platform has an ability for a headquarter user to communicate what those changes are and it shows up in an interactive store specific tablet application for the stores to execute. So that's what we do at One Door, and we work mostly with retail customers across different kinds of retail verticals, especially retail telecommunications, um, and obviously that's what we're gonna talk about as an example with T-Mobile today. And really it's um, kind of honing in on the second piece of what, we're, what we feel our value proposition is as a retail software, is that we're trying to show that there is a value to successful merchandising um, at a retail location. So we're trying to close that that understanding or that return on investment question for our retail customers by saying, here's the value of your store looking great. Here's the value of delivering on a good uh, customer experience. Um, and a little bit about myself. So I've been on the retail technology side. I think I had to calculate, got cut off here 10 years um, with various different technologies. And I really enjoyed coming to One Door just over three years ago as the director of customer success. And, um, Guy even mentioned it in his presentation this morning where I got the job and the title and I was like, wow, that sounds really cool. I have no idea what that is. And I had Google <laughs> and found a Boston community of customer success companies um, that really had some great supportive material and things out there. And what I ended up finding was it really combined all of the experiences in my career path that I would had to date into one position. So I have spent some time in account management. I've spent time training. I've spent time speaking, um, doing analytics, and doing customer satisfaction surveys and mobile research. And it was sort of like, hey, you get to try putting all of that together in one space. So it's been a really cool adventure at One Door so far. Um, and I'm happy to say this is probably one of the best stories that we've had coming out of um, my tenure there so far at One Door. Um, so we, um, you know, it, like all of you, when you go out to sell to your customers, they have particular business objectives that they're challenging you with to solve. They want to buy a software to help bridge those gaps for them. And so for T-Mobile, they came to us as, as they were going through the procurement process and they really said, we want a software that's gonna deliver on these things. We want a software that's going to help us author and communicate things singularly in one voice with consistency to all of our stores. We want to rapidly expand our footprint so we want a technology that's going to help scale with us. We want to be able to localize our product and messaging structure. So as a retailer, you can imagine it's quite important for them to be able to put bilingual signs in a store that needs bilingual language support or Spanish signs in a Spanish community um, because they want that connection for that customer experience with their, um, with their shoppers. And then lastly, they wanted to be able to respond to competitive and market conditions quickly. Um, so again, we're all familiar with how many ads we see on TV for AT&T and for T-Mobile and for Verizon and I'm sure we all remember the ball commercial where they roll down and they, you know, which ball's in front of each other and, you know, trying to point out which network has the best, you know, service, coverage area, et cetera. It's incredibly competitive landscape for these retailers. So they wanted technology that was going to take the, the level of effort it took them to turn on promotions and be able to do it faster so that they could respond to all of that more quickly. So that was our challenge. And you know, alongside this, you start to say, well, what metrics are they gonna hold us accountable for as a software provider to be able to deliver on those? So we said, well, let's start small. And so, oops, I jumped ahead, sorry. <laughs> so to kind of hit home, what is 
visual merchandising really mean before we jump into um, how we started that story with T-Mobile. I wanted to give you a visual example. This is the exact same fixture in three different stores in three different states that T-Mobile covers. And my little red uh, boxes kind of outline there's a lack of consistency across those photos. The first photo, it's missing price cards, it's missing some things. The second photo has more stuff than the third photo. The third photo has, you know, different arrangement of things. You can see the colors of the devices are slightly different. And so our platform tries to say again in that first bullet point, how do we create that consistency of message across those stores so they all are supposed to be executed the same? And that's really where the value of our software starts to come in. So just on being able to start comparing photographs across their stores, we could start proving that first value point on delivering as a software. So the journey we're gonna walk through is spans about the la a year and a half or so, last, um, last two years now, I'm looking back at the start of the relationship. And what I'm gonna kinda highlight are all these pivotal junctures in that relationship that really allowed us to to sort of amp up that our participation in the value conversation we were having with um, with T-Mobile. So as I mentioned, we started small. We said, you know, you've got a you've got an aggressive list of business objectives. You've got a lot of stores. Let's not bite off more than we can chew. Let's decide what is that digestible um, amount of stores for us to interact with first, and let's learn together, and then let's go from there. So we started with a 30 store pilot. And, you know, we, we had key learnings out of this business interaction with T-Mobile as well. So this was our fastest client implementation we ever did. It took us 56 days to get this customer up and running, and it may sound like a lot, but there's quite involved when we do store-specific plans for every single one of those locations. Um, we were able to test some new training materials with them, um, and we also then took a step back, learned from all that, and really wanted to say, this is if this becomes our best-in-class implementation model, how do we be able to do this across more customers more quickly? And so to give you a little bit of an example of how then T-Mobile started to learn, this is what they used to send to their stores. They would send out this confusing diagram of all the changes they wanted to happen in the store. They would send them in binders, so they were printing, hard copy, mailing, postage, uh, we're starting to go cha-ching, 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 right? Um, so where we entered in, we said, well, let's make this more seamless for the stores. Let's care about that audience and let's hear their voice within your organization and the solution they're really looking for. So in our application, they get this. That's their store as a store associate. And every one of those gold highlights is something that they have to go and do as a store associate to put up that promotion. So they get a sense of place in the application. They're able to then immediately know where they need to go and prioritize their tasks and then start delivering. And then they get specific instructions on each of those fixtures. So it takes that old visual and it puts all that relevant information in front of that user very easily. So they started to say, wow, you're giving us a single authoring platform, which is that first business objective. You're, letting, you're creating us a level of consistency across all of our stores. We're now able to see visually who's measuring up to that standard and who's not, which is you know, objective number two. And you did it in 56 days for 30 locations, so you're starting to show me you can scale with me and you can continue to grow with me. So out of that pilot, they said, this sounds like a good idea, let's move forward. So we moved into September to a rollout plan with them, and this chart just really shows that they had originally come to us saying that they wanted to you know, take their time, learn, you know, get their sea legs about them, and they were, weren't gonna ramp up actually until August. And that pilot went so well, they accelerated that rollout to May with us. So we started realizing revenue three months earlier than we expected because of how well that implementation went and how fast we were able to get that pilot and learn from it. So we were able to then start expanding, and you can see we started with 30 locations at the beginning of 2016, by the end of 2016, we're at over 4,000 stores with them. So, and we build stores specifically, so that was a, a very aggressive rollout and resource investment on our part. So, touching back on Guy's return on investments, we wanted to grow with this customer and we were willing to throw all the resources we needed to as a company in order to hit this. So in January, I went out and I said to each customer, I'm starting a quarterly business review process and I'm gonna start holding us accountable for some metrics, and I wanna know, are these metrics resonant with you? Are these what you'd measure us on? 
So this is an example of one of the ways we started presenting data back to the customers. First time our customers had seen data. Some of our customers had been with us for over 10 years, and others, like T-Mobile, was brand new. And so we had the first time that they're seeing data about how the product was being used, the different audiences in the product. So I really wanted to start creating a level of transparency with our customers about our app usage and about the value that they were going to be getting. So we'd start to get more front-footed in our discussions with our customers. So you can see here these metrics might look familiar to you because they're out of Tatango. Um, the first one was around utilization. This was our definition of utilization. We don't sell by seats. So we give an enterprise um, access to everyone in the company that signs up with us. And so this is a percentage of the authorized user group of that role, how many of those users came in and used the application within that time period. And that's how we're defining utilization. And then the second metric is active days, and that's as Tatango defines active days. So we know that they're doing something more meaningful in the application than just logging in. And so by starting to share this kind of data with our customers across the different roles that they had access to use in our application, we can start to see, like, that user group looks pretty low compared to everybody else. And what is it about that user group that becomes important to their overall adoption of the tool and what value they're starting to get out of their subscription with us? So we started small and thinking about how do we use this data together to try and show value both so that we can start justifying things on our end as a company, but also that our client can start talking about what value they're getting internally from our software. And so we looked at this district manager group and we said, you know what, they're really an important group. They're an influencer in the store manager group, which is our group on the far right. District managers own a set of stores. And if those stores aren't performing, that district manager needs to care about it. So if they're not using the app, if they're not engaged in the app, if they're not being enforced to use the app, then we, have a, we could have an, a usage problem. And we really believe our, our working hypothesis is that that store user group across all of our customers is our most important customer. It's the most vocal in any organization that we go into at retail, and it's the num largest number of users we have. So we have tens of thousands of store users across multiple continents at this point. Um, and these other user roles, they're much smaller user groups. So we may have an administrative team of three to five customers, three to five users, and a store manager base of, at T-Mobile, over 4,000 stores at this point, or 5,000 stores. So we have very um, different sized user groups across each of our clients, with that store user being really important. And so T-Mobile said, what can we do about this district manager? What can we, what can we create as a program to get them to use the app more. So we brainstormed together and we decided we were gonna provide them with Tatango Weekly Reports. So our Tatango Weekly Reports then included um, a feature, we, we did an education initiative around what we have as a compliance dashboard, which is the, the background image on this slide. Um, and so what the, the dashboard allowed each of our district managers to do was to go in and specifically curate their data for their list of stores, and they were able to look at their compliance. So, you know, if I gave you this photo to execute, and it looks like this, what's the delta between the two? That's how we measure compliance in the application. And so that dashboard reflects in real time what those metrics are, and they can search and export it, et cetera. So that's a really important data point for those district managers to understand. And the other one, we started to export from Tatango, and we created a um, report that had a number of active days and then the last active date. And so the usage in our app, we can't control how frequently a retailer is launching a promotion. That's their marketing budget, it's trade dollars, it's well beyond our control on us being able to influence them launching more promotions. But what we can me measure is if you've launched three promotions in the last week and you had those gold circles around fixtures on your floor plan that you were supposed to put up as a store, if you didn't get in at least three days, how do you know about all three promotions? So we can start to help give them some guidance on were you in at least three times? Did you have at least three active days in the last week? Did you, what was the last active date? Sure, sure better align with the last promotion launch that was in the app. So these district managers were given them this data, this tool to try and help them help themselves a lot better. And so that was how we were able to um, roll those out. And Rebecca, our CSM on T-Mobile, is here. And so she 
exports that report for them every week and mails it out to them. Um, and because it's user-based, it's not part of the automation yet into Tango, in case that was a question. I think the only the account one is automated. Um, so then we were able to move into our expansion phase with T-Mobile. And so if this wasn't already enough of an expansion, going from 30 stores to 4,000 stores in one year, um, we did even one better with them as a company. So they then signed up in year two, with, in beginning of 2017, going from 4,000 locations to over 5,000. So they have launched over 1,000 stores in the last year, and they did that all in our app. And then they said, well, we love what you're doing, and we're part of the Deutsche Telekom family of brands. Um, and if you're not familiar, Deutsche Telekom is in Germany, um, very large telco provider um, in Germany. And so they introduced us to T-Mobile Germany, T-Mobile Poland, and T-Mobile Puerto Rico. And I'm happy to say that we are live, or going live in T-Mobile Puerto Rico. Um, this, this currently, we're scheduling training and um, whatnot as the last phase of that. And the other two have been sort of stop and go ongoing conversations. But because we've, we had delivered on those business objectives, we've been able to show value. We've been doing that beyond just um, what, with what the software capabilities are. We're doing that with the extra reports. We were doing that with the quarterly business reviews. So all these things, they said, you know what, we have confidence in you as a vendor to you know, make that recommendation and to help you expand your footprint. So then we got into our NPS surveys. And again, sort of had a lot going on in 2016 on initiatives. So getting through the quarterly business review process with all of our clients was a big lift. And I said, you know what? We still have a missing data point here in our portfolio as a company, is we need NPS. So we launched our first round of NPS surveys um, in summer of 2016. And we asked, we had to invite each client to participate. Um, it may sound a little weird because you're like, well, don't you just hit a button, you send out the survey to everybody and you get the score. Um, a lot of retailers, store labor is unionized and we don't have that luxury. I can't hit that button and ask for everyone's survey. So I have to ask permission from every client in order to do it, which then gives you the ability to somebody say no. So um, that was a little frustrating, but T-Mobile, again, stepped up to the plate. They said, you know, so far we've learned really well with you. We want to keep learning. How do we do that? So we got a 63 on our first NPS um, with their store users. And you go, well, 63, hey, mine's a 98, <sighs> you know? Um, well, 63 relative to the apps in our space we compete with, one has a 40 and one has a 25. So we're feeling pretty good about the 63. And what I did with the verbatims was two things. I said, again, how do we learn together? How do we show value together from and, and this was done via SurveyMonkey, and in our own app, we have a surveying, um, surveying capa capability. Um, so we took all those verbatims and mined them for both our benefit and the customer's benefit. We said, how many of these things are things we need to fix as an app, and how many of these things are things you need to fix about what you're inputting in the app? Because we're only going to display the instructions you give us, so if your instructions don't make sense, we can't help you with that. So we ended up entering into a sales analysis project with them to really go back to the question they asked back in January, which was, how do I start showing the value of visual merchandising internally to my own organization? How do I have a different conversation with my cohorts across marketing and merchandising based on visual merchandising? So we got sales plan data, we got our Tatango data, and we used our own data, and we were able to combine those three data sources and see actually a strong correlation. It was really exciting because this was the first time we actually had all of the data sources from any customer to make that join across three different technologies, three different data sets on app usage. So the stronger, the more active they were as measured into Tango Active Days, the more compliant those stores were and the more compliant those stores were, they were either hitting plan or exceeding it from a sales perspective. So the stores said, you know, we have a great way to relaunch our retail initiative. We've got a juicy statistic we can go out now with to the retail field. And those stores are bonused on how well they hit that sales target. And so that meant dollars in people's pockets um, with an actual reward tied to it, as well as you can imagine the bottom line benefit as a company on what that value was to them. And so that was a great story. And if that weren't enough, we said, we're going to close this year and we're going to go out with the bang. So we asked, um, our 
T-Mobile contacts to participate with us in the largest retail event of the year. It's called NRF, and it's called The Big Show. It happened at the Javits in January. And our CEO took the stage with uh, T-Mobile's VP of Merchandising. This is Sarah Osmer, and I was going to share a video clip, but I'm running over, so I'm going to keep going really fast. Um, but we, she actually, on the main stage at NRF in front of an audience of over 100 and some people in our session, said, we couldn't have done those business objectives without this software. So we couldn't have gotten a more phenomenal endorsement on our product delivering for a customer than what she got on that main stage to deliver. And so that sort of closed out our year with um, T-Mobile over 2016, or 2017, excuse me. And you know, I think really exemplifies when you can engage with a customer in that value conversation, and you show your willingness to step up to the plate and do what you can to deliver on value beyond just what your software is, how, how willing they are to go above and beyond for you as a company, and what is that worth to you? So those are sort of my parting questions for you to start thinking about, is how can you start to deliver value beyond that subscription? Do you have a hypothesis like we did about a particular user group? Do you have a data set that you think you'd love to have your hands on in order to be able to connect those dots for your customer and then be able to have that value conversation a different way? Are you willing to invest in those resources? We hired a third-party statistician to re-crunch all the numbers to make sure when they were going to do that juicy marketing statistic that it was going to be a solid data point and it wasn't sort of a back of the napkin chicken scratch that you know, got us to the calculation that we wanted. We, so we invested in those things. And you know, then what's it worth? So for every introduction we just got and closed a new deal, that has actual dollars as a company that benefit our bottom line for them being a good advocate and a good partner. Um, so I hope this sort of uh, stimulated your creativity in thinking about what are those hypotheses you may have? Do you have a right customer to explore it with? And you know, can you start to have that value conversation differently and show that ROI um, on your, on your sub, uh, software subscription with your customers? So I'm well over. It's question time. <laughs> uh, so feel free to uh, shout out. There's a mic somewhere if there's any questions. Um, that was really great. Uh, what an, I, I love when I see programs executed eloquently, so well done. Um, the, how you um, made that correlation of the data to expansion and that focus before you had started that program, can you talk a little bit about h how you determine what was going to be that, that correlation? The, at the very end, the sales analysis that we did? Yes. Yeah. So. Um, our working hypothesis was that compliance and sales had a relationship, and we thought app usage and compliance had a relationship. So when we matched up the data sets, we just figured out what the key, like the store numbers ended up being our key identifier through all three data sets because our user data in Tatango is based on store ID. So that was the key indicator in data set one. and data set two, we measure compliance by store, so that mapped to the second field. And then they have sales incentives based by store, so we were able to map it then to the third data set. Um, so we analyzed the first part and did just a, a correlation to sort of litmus test whether or not the, the matchup was correct. And the correlation started to come in very strong on those two fields of app usage and compliance. And then when we layered in the sales data, then it, it also proved true. And so then besides that, besides just being able to come up with the juicy marketing statistic, we were also able to then say, what are the store attributes about that data set that were a strong performer that were similar? So we also had a second set of data for them to go back internally and say, your top performers are in the Northeast. They have this district manager. They are this size store. They're this. So now if you want all your store fleet to look like these guys, this is what they need to look like. And so we were able to slice the data because it tied to the store. One of the things that we've uh, noticed in our company and customer success, uh, the QBRs are a struggle. Um, so you mentioned that, so thank you for saying that too. Um, curiosity, since you went out and asked all of your different stores, right, what, what kind of data did they really want you to focus on? Because obviously 
a lot of times we build what we hope that they want to see. And I'd love to hear what some of the feedback you were given. So initially, everyone was just excited to see those metrics presented for the first time. So they were like, hey, that, that list looks pretty good. Four cycles later, after going through all of 2017's reports, um, one of the ones that I love that we, I, I'm still figuring out with our product team was a piece of feedback was, how do you close the feedback loop in your QBRs with your customers? So for all the issues that they present or the um, product enhancements they're asking for, how do you show where they're falling in the product roadmap? That's been one that we want to be able to show in the next round of QBRs. Um, the other one that we've included is some of our statistics. We look at all of our support ticketing and talk about you know, how many tickets they've had. So um, that one always has some resonance because the longer they're outstanding, sometimes the more sensitive the customer is to um, the issues or the, the, your, the status of your relationship can be heavily influenced by a lot of outstanding tickets that they um, perceive as not being answered quickly enough. Um, and then I think there was another one on, uh, um, there was like a third, but I, I'm spacing on what it was. But they, it's been an evolution. And I think the, the one that I think would be most helpful for us to close loop on is the including the product roadmap feedback loop. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about um, like how you segment your team as you're rolling out to more I guess, across different countries and different languages. Um, how does it work in terms of like training and then who runs QBRs and since there's so, so many divisions? That, that's a great question. Um, I, I like to say that I'm a mighty team of three. It's me, myself, and I. Um, so I actually, as customer success, sit between product and client services. And so um, I have been really busy. Um, so I, I actually had an intern help me build a faster way to template slides and get the data out and um, crunch the numbers so that way I could speed up slide production for QBRs. Um, so that was a, a little lift. Uh, I've been working with both internal training and client training. So I only have to train around our software releases and we have a very lumpy schedule as to when those happen and whether they come off on time. So um, in some regards it's been nice that I'm a team of me, myself, and I, because I can put myself where I need to when it happens. Um, but we have a great client management team, and so whenever we need to, they step up and they're part of the equation as well. Um, our product team will go out and train if they need to. On a, um, in fact, colleagues covering one this week while I'm out here. So um, we just try and be agile. We're a pretty small shop, and so we try and keep that 